Hello everybody and welcome to the Intro to Video production. So we're coming live uh, from uh, Blue Mountains, Ontario. And this is the Creator Space Mobile Digital Arts Lab. Um, we will have uh, multiple workshops and today we'll be looking at uh, video production. Um, I put up a, a URL, so events.tbmcs.ca if you want to look at what else is coming up, uh, different webinars you can sign up for. And um, yeah, we're really excited to, to start this uh, series of live webinars to reach you uh, live right at your homes. And good news too is uh, as you're registered with Crowdcast, this will also be available for a replay. So you can go back and, and look at uh, some of the points that we talk about and, and review some of this information as well. So we're gonna have a jam packed uh, about uh, 45 minutes and we'll do a Q&A right after. So, you know, stay tuned, save any questions. You can type them in as we go to and, and um, I'm gonna get to as many as we can after. Um, so yeah, welcome. So my name is, uh, my name is Tom Sternad. Uh, I'm the lead digital artist of uh, the Creator Space and we are uh, a partnership and uh, we have uh, funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and we have uh, a partnership uh, with three libraries now. Um, so we have the, the Blue Mountains Public Library, the Collingwood Public Library, and the Wasaga Beach Public Library. So welcome everyone and members of those libraries as well. So let's uh, have a look at what we're going to talk about today. So here's the, uh, an overview. And so to start, we're going to look at uh, what is digital video. Uh, we will then look at video formats, video frame rates, then we'll look at image control techniques, framing, shot sizes, focus and exposure. We'll look at lens types from wide angle to telephoto or zoom lenses. And then also um, we will look at uh, video with personal devices and iPads, iPhones, that idea. Video with photography cameras, so DSLRs, many of which can handle video now as well. And also finally a video with video cameras and digital cinema cameras. So we'll look at all these uh, devices and things what we can do with the uh, uh, technology that you have at home already and uh, just you know getting familiar with everything. So some of these concepts may sound foreign, some of them um, you know you already have an understanding of. Uh, so you know we welcome you know you don't really have to have a, a big knowledge base in, in video. Video surrounds us. We're doing video right now as we speak and this video webinar. Um, but the cool thing is is that once we can understand some of these concepts, um, you know when, when we go over these concepts and we can think about what you know, formats are and frame rates and so on, we start to get an idea of uh, how we can control these things too. So a lot of things like our phones or our iPads or even cameras um, we'll use a lot in auto modes. And today we want to kind of demystify what some of these aspects are from formats to frame rates and how we can control things to, uh, to help us make better visuals or to use the visuals and video to help us tell stories, whatever they are, whether they're fictional, factual documentaries, whatever it may be. So that's what we want to get to. That's our goal today is to really get a good understanding of what makes video. So let's start up. So what is digital video? So digital video is uh, a series uh, of still images or frames. And so they're captured by light sensitive sensor and that's translated to digital data. So this is the key that it's, we're talking about digital video. So that ones and zeros, like the digital data, and then that ends up being stored somewhere. And we'll talk a bit later about that too, the storage aspect, like where does this stuff go, this data, the video. So, you know, here I just put some notes, solid state memory cards, digital tape, hard drives, uh, they could be thumb drives or even cloud, right? So these are, you know, where, where does the video data go, right? So we're talking about data. So that's what digital video is. So remember, the key here is that it's still images and frames. So we want to look at, think about that concept throughout because we're still capturing still frames that a series of them to create moving images. So video formats, this is a question that comes up a lot. You know, what format should I be using? And the, you know, more and more now we have uh, um, different formats are available and uh, with phones and cameras, 
it used to be that video just had one format. So the format is, is uh, dealing with the idea of how many horizontal and vertical lines of resolution uh, that form the image size. So because there's some sort of data, it's, it's not organic. So it's you know, using lines and squares and pixels. So that's what's important about formats. So por formats give us a, gives us the ability to you know, have a lot of details or to have, um, you know, uh, it could be less detail, right? So the more vertical and horizontal lines, the better the quality is um, and, and we'll go from there. So formats, they continue to evolve, but we wanna look at the original format for video and television with standard definition. So it was just 720 by 480, so 720 vertical lines by 480 horizontal lines. So it wasn't a very big image, and that's all that most TVs were for the longest time until, until we got into high definition. So standard definition is, is pretty low quality when you look at it as a uh, individual frame size. So keep that in mind. So here's a chart of the different formats, and it kind of takes us to you know, where we're going with things and what's, what's available really with most of our own technology. So, you know, our iPhones and iPad Pros, they can handle the highest resolutions on this chart. And same with um, our DSLRs, our photo cameras and our video cameras, they can handle that as well. So standard definition, it's 720 by 480. So you can see like that square there. And then this isn't necessary to scale. So, you know, ratios will be another discussion as well, but standard definition 720 by 480. Then HD, so high definition, 1920 by 1080. And then we get into UHD. And UHD slash 4K is what a lot of us are seeing more and more for. It's the, it's the new fad, right? Of what, what you want to get, what kind of new TV set you want to get a 4K. So that is 3840 by 2160. So you can see we're doubling from 1920 by 1080 and times two, we get 4K or Ultra HD, 3840 by 2160. Then there's also one more, and this is something that the Creator Space uh, digital cinema cameras um, have access to as well in terms of a format. And so I just wanna mention here, so it's 4K DCI. So 4K gets thrown around a lot as a format. And um, you know, there's Ultra HD, but the true 4K is designed for cinema use. And that is 4096 by 2160. So it's a little bit of a wider screen than the UHD, right? So that's the cinema quality. So if you go to a theater and they're projecting in 4K, that's the exact specifications that it would be 4096 by 2160. So you can see we're starting to get into, as an individual image, we're getting into a, a much more superior quality as we go from just 480 horizontal lines to 2,160 horizontal lines. So a lot more data, a lot more quality in the image, um, and a lot more information. So we can you know, even be zooming into these images, whereas in standard definition, they'd be pretty fuzzy if we ever try to do that. So I don't know if anyone's ever had that as the older footage and you're trying to put it into HD, you'll notice that it could be a little bit fuzzy as you try to uh, um, up res it, it's called, to full HD. So let's go into uh, frame rates. So the frame rate is referring to how many frames are captured or shown per second. So here I put an example, 30 frames per second or 30 FPS. So just a short form, frames per second, FPS. So uh, when it comes down to it, that's the whole essence of video. It comes from motion picture. So when photography started, there was a concept of if you take multiple photographs fast enough and then play them back, you can basically uh, recreate motion, so motion picture, right? So literally taking pictures and making them into motion picture, right? So we have that term. So with film, the standard base uh, eventually became 24 frames per second. And prior to that, film was actually, you know, from the 1800s, uh, the turn of the century there, 
when it was invented, it was hand cranked. So there wasn't really an exact frame per second. So it was, it just depended on roughly how fast the operator and also the projector projectionist would, would uh, play it back. So what would happen is sometimes in more exciting parts of films, the older films, um, the projectionist would get excited and maybe uh, crank it a little bit faster than, uh, and, and make things go a little bit faster. Um, so, you know, that was the thing. So an action scene would seem faster just because there is excitement by the projectionist hand cranking it a bit faster. So with the advent of sound, we get into the synchronized frame rates. So there needed to be a standard so that the sound wouldn't shift because if you play something back too fast or too slow, then the voice could sound different. So too slow, it could be, oh, I'm really slow. And then too fast, I'm really, really fast. So we want to uh, have that kind of a synchronization standard. So what happened was it was determined that 24 frames per second would become the universal standard for film motion picture with the advent of sound. So that standardization is there. It really continues to this day. So we have you know over 100 years of this film standard frame rate um, when you're dealing with 35 millimeter celluloid film prints. And then with video, the overall standard from the beginning was 30 frames per second. And I have a bracket here, it's actually 29.97 frames per second. And that's just because there's a 0 0.03 is required to do uh, electronic synchronization. Now, why is it 30 frames per second? The, so the, just a quick overview of that. It was 30 frames per second because originally there needed to be something to synchronize television sets so that they would know how to scan in each frame or each second and keep everything going to some sort of a clock. So without giving every home some sort of synchronization device, it was decided that they could use the electrical hertz, so 60 hertz. So each frame is split into two and that's how we get something called interlacing. So there's the odd and the even horizontal lines, they're split into two. So 30 frames can then use the 60 Hertz to show those 60 individual frames that eventually end up, they show up fast enough, they end up looking like motion picture. So they look like a, a seamless 30 frames per second video image. So that's why we have that standard. And then just a side note, in uh, Europe, there's something called PAL. So this is North American standard. In Europe, there's something called PAL. It's 25 frames per second. And same thing happens there. 50 Hertz is the electrical signal, hence 25 frames per second, so that it could be doubled into 50. So that's the reason we have that. So from the beginning, we had this kind of difference of 30 frames and 24 frames, and it still continues. And we'll look at the frame rates. So the uh, original frame rate, as I mentioned, of video, 30 frames per second to allow for television use. And then there was a kind of a big change. So 1999 was exciting. Star Wars Episode One, not just because of that, but because it was actually one of the first digital video acquisitions that they managed to capture using video in 24 frames per second, a whole film. So this was big. There were some indie uses of video in those frame rates, and there's different formats to try to do this kind of a frame rate. But video was always 30 frames. So this is the beginning of digital cinema, where we can now have digital video images shot at 24 frames per second, just like analog celluloid film would be shot. And now digital video, we can actually do 25 frames per second and a lot more. So let's look at the chart here. So there's so many frame rates now and these frames per second. So this is in HD and Ultra HD. And if we go back, just a little precursor to this, if we go back and recall the format discussion, HD is 1920 by 1080, UHD is the 2160 horizontal lines, right? So that 3840 by 2160, those two are double, right? So HD to UHD. So remember, we're getting double the amount of data per frame, per image. So again, there's going to be more data requirements, and oftentimes we'll see in these UHD 4K formats that you can't always do the highest frame rates. So just keep that in mind when I go through this chart. HD can do a lot higher frame rates. 
and the UHD um, can, is usually limited based on the fact that it has to store this big data and write it fast enough onto some sort of a drive or, um, or a, a solid state uh, card, right? So we need something that can, can write to fast enough. So if we look at the frame rate, so 23.98, this was established so that it could uh, you know, match precisely the 29.97 for television. So that's the television mode 24 frame. So oftentimes uh, TV shows will be video shot at 23.98, so they can match perfectly for the 29.97 video. So, and then this is, it gets a little bit confusing because sometimes people will call it 24 frames, but it is actually 23.98. So when you look at uh, one of the cameras I'll introduce today, uh, it will have those options between 23.98 and 24. So 24 is specifically designed for theatrical projection. And that's, it has a digital cinema standard at 24 frames per second. So when we go and watch a movie in the theater, and if it is digitally projected or even digitally captured, it's usually done so at 24 exactly, because there's no uh, synchronization required with power. The projectors have their own syncing mechanism. Okay, so that's a little bit on that. Then we get into 29.97, we go into 30. Cameras can do like an exact 30 as well for not really sure why, but they can. Um, 48 frames, so that starts to go into an, like an enhanced uh, amount of motion capture versus 24 frames. So you're capturing double the amount of information. So it starts to get a bit sharper if when things are moving. Then you get into 59.94, and that's again, just doubling, so more frames you know, essentially more frames, better quality or, or higher amounts of data and image capture to have smoother motion. And then you can have a straight 60. And now we're seeing things such as 120 frames and Gemini Man, the film that is, uh, I think it's available now, you can watch it. Um, 120 frames is, uh, can be captured now as well, right? So that's, that's an interesting uh, thing of how, you know, fast things can go. Okay, so frame rate. Really what I wanna point out here is that people will often ask me, what's the best frame rate to use? And there isn't really you know, a specific answer to say, okay, you should use this or that. It really comes down to, I like to make the analogy, it's like painting. So what kind of paint do you wanna use? You know, will you, do you wanna use oil paint, acrylic, watercolors? Every type of paint has different advantages and dis disadvantages, just like frame rates do. So they really become an artistic choice. Sometimes someone might request an exact frame rate for a project, so you might be told a frame rate, but as video and filmmakers, we get to choose the frame rate. And again, it's an artistic choice. So you wanna think about you know, why. And the best thing is to really choose different frame rates and see what they do. So here's just kind of a guideline. So the higher the frame rate, we have less blur, so because there's more frames per second, right? So you can imagine someone running really fast. At a high frame rate, you're gonna see every single movement of the body captured frame by frame, right? So higher frame rates, less blur, and also there's more sharpness in the action. So what we end up seeing is a lot of the higher frame rates, like the 5994 in HD, ends up being used for things like sports. So like football, hockey will be shot in that format and that gives that better sharpness in the action because there's a lot of fast movement, right? So that's, that's that. Then the lower frame rates, like 24, you end up with more motion blur, right? So motion blur isn't a bad thing, but it's, you know, there's blur, right? And there's also a little bit of softness in the action. And this is again, more of an artistic approach. And the one thing too is that we're so, a lot of us have you know, seen decades of this and also you know, humanity right now, we've seen over a hundred years of 24 frames per second. So we're kind of used to this, that kind of a cinema look that has a certain amount of blur and softness and so on. And something like Gemini Man, when uh, the idea was that it's, it's a futuristic film that it wanted, you know, the uh, Ang Lee, the director wanted to really have a hyper realistic look to it. So it's super realistic. Uh, and not a, a lot of theaters can even project it at that frame rate. 
So it's generally going to be just shown at 24 or 48 frames per second. But the idea is that if you can really see it in 120 frames, that it, they say it's, it's this kind of uh, hyper-realistic beyond reality. You feel like you're seeing it in with some new set of eyes, right? So again, a very artistic choice. There wasn't really a technical reason. and in, in fact, it was very difficult to shoot that many frames a second. So that artistic choice is important as a director, vid videographer, filmmaker, you know, experiment with the frame rates. And there's no right or wrong answer. So try and experiment with these different frame rates. And, um, you know, oftentimes that's what we'll look at is there's a lot of presets in um, things like your iPad or, you know, different cameras, photo cameras. But the more you can experiment and control and change those frame rates, the better it is to, to figure out what, what can work for you artistically. Okay, so moving on. So device and storage limitations. So this is really important. We talk about the frame rates and you know what they represent the individual frames. So that's based on the format, right? So we have those format, we have the amount of frames per second. Together, that ends up creating how many frames per second in a 4K resolution, for example, need to be captured. So that means you know it's double the amount of data than in an HD. So 24 frames at HD is, you know, let's say it's, we'll just say for, for an example, it's one gigabyte. And if Ultra HD or 4K is captured, it's gonna be approximately two gigabytes, right? So double, right? So then you start to need more data, right? So that, that uh, storage requirements, that's important. So, you know, this, this can be a large data amount. And if you, let's say you're shooting video with an iPad or your iPhone, um, or you know with another tablet or smartphone there you're limited to what you can store on the phone as well And then you have to offload it, right? So sometimes it might be advantageous to have a smaller format if you have to shoot something longer um, And then you can have a higher uh, resolution format if you're shooting something that's shorter So that can really help to uh, determine right and another thing too is not all devices support all the formats and the frame rates so for example, like I have a iPhone 7 and I can't do Ultra HD with it and the 8s can and the, you know, different models keep changing. Um, so different limitations sometimes are put on and it depends on the camera and so on. So that's something to realize that sometimes you might only be able to HD and that's okay. So, you know, really start by working with you, what you have and that's what we're gonna look at today is just working with available tech that you have. And these, you know, these limitations, don't think of them as limitations because at the end of the day, HD, the fact that you can do an HD video capture with something as simple as your phone um, in, a, in a good quality camera is pretty amazing. So we have little cinema cameras in our pockets that we walk around with. And, you know, most digital cinemas, even in, uh, in theaters when you go to a cineplex, we're just, uh, you know, they're presenting the films in 2K. So we're not even, you know, there's not even a lot of 4K projectors necessarily. That's usually in the the, the ones like those Ultra AVX theaters or, um, you know, when you see IMAX or, you know, specifically the special theaters. But generally a lot of digital cinema projection in most movie theaters is just 2K. And that is 2048 by 1080. So you can see that's only 128 more horizontal lines than the regular HD format. So... You know, what's in your pocket in an iPhone is really the same quality of what you're seeing on a screen in a theater. So let's remember that. So there's no, no real issue. We just work with what we have. Okay, so let's move on to image control. So with, with image control, it's really important to, uh, we talked about the, the formats, the frame rates, and now we want to look at image control and how do we start looking at uh, framing, focus and that kind of manipulation. So not just how the technical specs, the resolutions and everything, that's fine. But now we want to start looking at a little bit of the uh, artistic information as well. So, you know, what are the best practices for framing? So what I have here is uh, we're going to look at this uh, concept of, you know, how do you choose and design what's in your frame, right? So if you think of your frame as a canvas and you know, it's this, this horizontal canvas. And we're gonna just really look at the horizontal imaging, um, not so much vertical uh, in today's workshop, but uh, the rule of thirds. So if you take uh, three lines or you divide your screen into basically nine quadrants, you get four connecting intersecting points. So if there's, you know, uh, so you got three 
uh, rectangles on top and uh, horizontally vertically, you can see where these circles are. Those are the connecting points. So the rule of thirds, the idea is that visually uh, pleasing composition will line up with subjects uh, and um, you know focus points in these spots. So basically the two on the top and the two on the bottom. Um, and if you can have things that are in both the top and the bottom, then it's even more symmetrical or visually pleasing. So this is just the rule of thirds. It can be you know broken, but this is the idea. And if you can, it's fun to look at paintings and just see how artists over the centuries have used this idea or not used this idea, right? So again, rules are meant to be broken, but let's talk about what they are. So here's an image uh, from a documentary that, uh, that I uh, captured. And uh, so this is, you can see the subject is lined up. I just put some lines on the screen and to show that rule of thirds and a little arrow there. So roughly you can see his head um, and his eyes and going down the two points um, intersect there. So by putting him on, this is on uh, camera right or screen right, uh, it allows us to create that visually pleasing type of image there. Um, and, you know, and, you know, just to criticize this, if that paint, the, there's a draw, there's a, I think a historical photo there or something, that would be better in the left side if that was in the next intersecting point, if we really wanted a little bit of a better composition. But again, having the subject like that, that's, you know, visually pleasing instead of having him just in the center. So that's a tendency sometimes just to put people right in the center, but we have this horizontal canvas for video. Um, so why not use those rule of thirds? Here's another example uh, from the same documentary. So, you know, a bit, this is a, a live reenactment of uh, um, the 1812 uh, battles and things. So you can see, I just put some lines out and again, it's not perfect, but you can see roughly the idea is to try to get the soldiers in these interesting uh, intersecting points, rule of thirds. And these grids you can actually uh, often put onto uh, to display. On your on your cameras and device and video devices, so you can it can even assist that way uh, to make that work, right? So now on the other side, you see the puff of smoke is getting into another intersecting point on the right, right? So from the left, we have the two soldiers, and then we play with these lines, and this is really kind of a, a you know happy accident, I like to call it. The fence materials are rising up; they are on an angle, and they're all moving towards those subjects in the left. Uh, rule of third interesting points, the intersecting points, right? So you got the two fences kind of pointing to the subject. So it's really fun to, to play with these lines and leading us to that. So it's a pretty interesting image. Just happened to work out, um, you know, not a lot of planning in this. It just, they're standing in the right spot and, and it worked out well. So, you know, th these are great. Sometimes it works out really well. Okay, so image uh, control. Now the next thing I wanna talk about are the shot sizes. So different shot sizes can help tell the story visually. So every video or film, they're essentially made of a bunch of shots edited together. So we have long shots or wide shots that can help establish the location and space. So you can see here, this is what is a wide shot. So we can see that you know, two soldiers are walking uh, down a path with trees, right? So it's just establishing where they are. There's a fence, there's some forest and trees lining them and and they're walking, right? So the wide shot really helps to establish the location and the space. Same shot, they just move forward. They're walking closer. So when you get the medium shot, you can see how much more information we see right away. So we're getting closer to the story and the action. You can almost, you know, if they're saying something, now we feel like we can hear them or, you know, we're right in there in the action, right? So we're bringing the audience closer. So this is a, a medium shot. Then we get into things like close-ups and extreme close-ups. So this is like a, a detail. So showing some detailed information um, that's important to help better tell the story. So in this case, we can see that uh, the soldier is reaching for a, a gunpowder cartridge, right? So it helps tell that story of, of how the process works. Otherwise, without this close-up, we don't know the gunpowder is stored on the side like that, right? So that close-up tells us, okay, there's something there. What is it? And we learn what it is because eventually he loads it and fires the, the gun. So that kind of close-up reveals really important information. So you can imagine a close-up on a map. Here's the treasure, right? That kind of idea, they really help tell the story. So then there's a, the idea of shot size variety. So this is uh, from 
uh, a creator space uh, project that was done in one of the master classes and here's an establishing wide shot so this was a, a, a film that uses a variety of shots to you know bring us into the action so you can see this wide shot shows us where we are uh, this stuff happening two characters magazines and you know establishes what's there right so that really wide big open shot now we get into a medium shot so just like we did with the soldiers we're getting closer we start to see the characters more we can see details more and understand you know what a little bit more about them by being closer we feel like we're in there we can talk with them like we're kind of sitting in on the action and this is also called the two shot so just some quick terminology so two actors in one shot it's referred to as a two shot so here's a great example of a medium shot two shot and then from there we can go into close shots so or they can also be called singles one actor in it uh, and this brings the audience in for dialogue so when someone starts speaking it's a great idea to um, to do that to have you know the audience in closer to really see the dialogue and and go from there so you can see this is a close-up of one actor and then this is called the reverse shot so now it's a close-up of the opposite actor and you can see there on the it's you know a mirror image of from this shot to this shot so here he's on the right and then here our actor is on the left right so that complementing shot reverse shot it's called and then you get the other actor's dialogue right so that's a great tool to get us into close-ups and then let's say they talk 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 back and forth and we could go back to the medium shot, back to the wide shot, right? So you can see that those four types of shots really are the essence of what a lot of films are. So next time you're watching a, a film or one of your favorite films, watch some of the scenes and you'll see how there's a variety of these shot sizes, wide, medium, close-ups, close-ups. That's kind of the universal essence of most uh, video production are those shot size varieties. So then the next thing we'll get into is focus. So image control focus. So the focus decides what we're looking at. So by having things that are in focus or out of focus, we can guide the audience to see and guide them to where we want them to look or to what they, you know, guide them to not see things. So, um, you know, so really focus can have almost everything in focus. So in this case, you know, this is a shot where essentially like an infinity focus. So you can see the actors are in focus, the background is in focus, so everything's in focus, so we can see everything. Typically wide shots have everything in focus because we want to establish what's there, right, and what things look like. Then if we get into uh, some selected depth, so here we have a medium two shot again, um, and you can see the background is now out of focus. So we're choosing as the artist to only have the actors in focus and to have the background out of focus, right? So that's, that's a way we can do that. And now here, you can have just the middle in focus. So it goes to this kind of extreme selective focus, which is the background is out of focus and the foreground is out of focus. So only the middle ground, right? So you see the actor on the right, he is out of focus. The actor in the middle, she is in focus and the background's out of focus. So it's really selective focus, right? So again, guiding the eye, Right? If we had, let's say, her out of focus and we had the background in focus, then we'd be looking at what's on the wall. And that means that we're saying that, that what's on the wall is important. Right? So that deciding what's in focus will guide the viewer's eyes. Right? So keep that in mind, always figuring out the focus. Okay, so the next thing, let's move along here, we got to exposure. So exposure, we're essentially dealing with how much light is allowed to go to the sensor, through the lens, or how sensitive the actual sensor is to light, right? So here in this case, we're gonna look at the exposure of lenses and apertures and digital apparatus like your phone, smartphone or tablet uh, will do the same idea. It just, it's, uh, you know, it's a representation of these apertures. So this is a manual samples here on the, on the right. And what happens is the smaller the f-stop, so in this case, it says f1.4, the lens aperture, you can see, is totally open. So you can see right through. So the maximum amount of light is going through that lens. The larger the f-stop, the less light that goes through. So you can see from f1.4 to 2.8, slightly closed, all the way to f8.0, it's tiny, right? And it can go all the way to 22, 
and it's like a pinhole, right? So very little light is coming in. So that means we can control how much light is going in and to deal with the right exposure. So if there's a really bright sunny day, we're gonna want that really closed down, so high f-stop. And if it's a really dark room, we're gonna want that lens opened up at f1.4 to allow as much light in as possible. Then the next thing here is exposure and ISO. So ISO, or ISO, uh, based on film stock, and the idea was that the higher the number, the more light sensitive it could be. But what happens is, and it's similar to the, the sensor, they do the same thing, but with film originally, lower ISO, so 50 would be a, a type of stock that was used a lot, um, it would have very fine grain detail. So it had tiny grains, a uh, lot of sharpness and detail, better image quality. And then if you went higher to like 1600, the, the, uh, the grains needed to, the, like the celluloid, uh, the grains in it, the film grain needed to be bigger so that they could capture more information quickly, right? So, because again, remember we have frames per second, so it's going that many frames per second, it has to capture and expose that quickly, right? So uh, these higher ISOs are um, end up getting noisy with less detail, right? So technically we can range now from like 50 or 100 ISO to 25,000 or more. Um, but what happens is we start to get into more noise, right? But it's great for low light or dark situations where you just have available light and you can only do so much. So, but what happens is you introduce a little bit of noise versus the ISO 100. So there's a nice chart here. You can see from 100 all the way to 25,600, just how different it, it goes from, you know, less noise, better image quality and a lot of detail all the way to that noisy. You can see there's like the green and purple and all that kind of noise in the, in the image, right, that happens. So just something to be aware of. I think we've all experienced that. If it's kind of a dark room, you have your smartphone and, um, you know, you can, and it's really dark and it gets all that noise showing up or in the middle of the night, you think, oh, there's a great star to, uh, or moon I want to capture. And the, and the sky ends up being really noisy as you try to open that ISO up. Okay, so what is proper exposure? So the great thing about digital technology versus film or analog technology is what you see is what you get. So proper exposure, really, you want to make sure you can see the image properly and understand what the image is. That's really the, the base guideline. It's really hard to say what's perfectly exposed, right? Because there's also in intentionally underexposing if you want to... Um, you know, have a, a, a darker mood or if you want to overexpose, right? So I, I put a couple of image samples here. So one from a night, uh, basically um, uh, dusk scene, the, the sun just set, fog. And you can see that it was underexposed intentionally just to have it even darker looking like it is in the, in the middle of the night. And then the image below it was overexposed intentionally because it was designed to be a snowy, uh, you know, middle of the day, snowy, bright, you know, lots of color. So, you know, that, that's the thing too. So you can create different moods. So obviously underexposing can be moody, uh, horror films are oftentimes dark and underexposed, and you can create different feelings. You can have things that are overexposed. So we've seen that in, you know, things like sci-fi movies or space movies where there's a lot of white um, backgrounds and they're very bright and that kind of uh, looks like a spaceship idea versus the horror film that's dark, right? So think about the moods and how it makes you feel with exposure. Um, but really, as long as you can see what the image is um, and get that idea, that's really the kind of exposure basis you want to hit. Can I see the image? So overexposure, where it's totally white and there's too much light, I can't see the image. So that's really not working well for your storytelling. And if it's too dark and it's totally black and I can't see anything, that's an issue too, right? So you want to get right in the middle and then, you know, you can play with those nuances based on the feelings and moods you want to do. Here's a little advice, uh, digital video. So essentially digital video is always uh, better to be underexposed slightly than overexposed. So it's easier to fix and there's more webinars we'll be looking at um, the uh, color grading aspect. So it's easier to fix something that's slightly underexposed than something that's overexposed and potentially blown out and it's hard to, to fix that. So if something's darker, we can always boost it a bit, but if something's too bright, it's almost called clipping and it's hard to really fix that. It's similar to like audio. If the sound is totally clipped, it's hard to fix that, 
versus if the sound's a bit lower, you can boost it, right? So think of it that way. So if anything, it's always better to underexpose a bit than to overexpose. You can always fix that better. Okay, some advice on that. So let's move along here. So lens types. So we have a wide telephoto. So we have different types of lenses. So they can be, um, you know, think of the focal length. You'll hear different numbers, 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 200 millimeter. So think of the wide, the smaller the number, the wider it is. So we'll have fisheye lenses, like GoPro type things that are, you know, 7.5 millimeter, so super wide. Then you have telephotos that are 200 millimeters. So you can think of it as a telescope, right? So a telephoto is like a telescope. So think of, you know, if you want to be able to see the stars, you need that long lens, right? So that's a telephoto. The wide lens, if you think of it, it's more like a GoPro, right? So you can see everything in it. So the wider, the more you can see. Wide lenses generally tend to be more like our own eyes. Because if you think about it, you can see quite a lot. Versus a zoom lens is very special to video because it's not a normal thing for humans. So most of our devices, we have something, uh, usually it's a zoom lens. So if you think of your iPhone or iPad, you can zoom in on things by like, you know, zooming in with your fingers to like zoom in on the image. So you're basically changing the lens from a wide to a telephoto. So you're essentially zooming in, right? So just a little bit on the lenses. It gets more complicated than that, but just, just an idea of if you think about wide, a wide lens gets you wide shots, right? A telephoto gets you, you know, zoomed in on the action, right? And you can really be uh, um, close zoomed in on things. Okay, so let's start looking at some of the, our personal devices. What can we do with something like uh, an iPad, an iPhone, um, right? So in the, in the camera mode, I'm just going to go to my iPad here. So in the camera mode, um, when we when we go to the camera, so usually we have like the little uh, camera here. Let me just get it. there. We go. So the camera, if we if we engage that, right, we can go to the camera, and then um, what we need to do is we can then go to the video mode. So I'm going to just hit the button here. Let me just switch over right to the. Uh, to that screen there we go okay so what I'll do then is here's my nice coffee that I have and the keyboard so what I'll do is instead of photo what we need to do is right on the bottom here I need to go to video mode right and you can see right away it engages this uh, red circle and that lets me start recording right and then what we can do too is you can see by getting you know close to things you can focus really close. And then if I use my fingers, you can see, right? I can zoom in and zoom out, right? We have a little uh, setup here that I'm gonna use as well. So you can see if I go onto, you know, objects, I can zoom in on them. And again, it's not the brightest in here. So you can see some of the noise that starts to show up. So zooming in, zooming out. And you can see on the left there, there's a little bit of a, a, a bar as well that you can go plus minus, right? So remember, this is the wide. This is our zoomed in telephoto lens, right? So we can go up and down like so. And the nice thing too is what we can do is this little yellow square shows up. So if I tap on, let's say I want to tap on the goat here. If I hold that, you'll see what happens is it, on the top it says AEAF lock. So that's auto exposure and auto focus lock. And what that does is it's now uh, keeping my exposure at that level and the focus at that level. So if someone, let's say, if my hand were to go in front, notice how that stays in focus and my hand isn't getting in focus, right? So really important, if you're shooting video, we can use those lock features on an iPad to ensure that we can lock, right? So you can see quickly, we can, we can you know, use a lot of what we just talked about the exposure and so on. And then the nice thing too is we have this uh, the sun here, this brightness, and I can basically adjust the exposure by touching that little sun icon, right? And that's really cool. So I can underexpose, right? I can overexpose. You can see that, right? Way overexposed. But again, it could be an artistic thing. This is kind of, you know, it's an out-of-body goat experience. Or here we can 
we can kind of underexpose it. All of a sudden we get into kind of moody what's happening in the dark, right? So really, really fun way to do that. Okay, so now what I want to do is uh, I'm going to just get out of this and I'm going to go over to settings on the, on the iPad. Okay, so let's, let's look at that. So basically what happens is the, uh, the settings panel here, um, there's a, a camera mode here, right? And what, what we want to be able to do is, right? So I'll go right to camera, okay? And what it can do is I can put grids on. So let's do that. I'll put the grids on and that's going to help me see, work with my rule of thirds, right? Um, and then on the record video, here's the fun thing. I can choose different formats. So there's a 720p HD, 30 frames, or there's the 1080 HD. So 720, 1280 by 720 uh, used to be a, like a regular HD and then there became full HD. So it's still a good quality. So that's another format that can be used. And then it, it gives you comparison. It uses about 15 to 20% less data, right? So that's, that's an option. Then I can go to formats. So I can go high efficiency uh, or most compatible. So high efficiency um, will give me one type of format and then there's the uh, most compatible, right? So the high efficiency will be like uh, MOVs with uh, the, the uh, Apple and, and that's it. So then depending on your device, what will happen is uh, depending on the device, there will be different format settings. Right, so um, you'll have uh, different frame rates available, different formats available. So they could be 4K and so on. And just like I have here on the note here, the uh, you know an iPhone 8, uh, they started doing 4K. iPad Pros, you can do 4K. Right, so it just really depends on your model. Right, but like I said before, 1080 HD is a fantastic uh, uh, you know format to use, and it's really not an issue. So here. Now that let's go back to this. So you can see by when I engage the grid, right? I quickly now have a grid, right? So I can now figure out my rule of thirds. It's like we talked. So now I can put the goat in the intersecting rule of thirds, right? And I can put the goat on the bottom quadrant on the top. And that grid quickly lets me deal with uh, rule of third concepts, right? So remember we have the uh, ability to do the auto exposure, auto focus. We can put the grid on, right? Choosing your formats. We hit record. It's going to go into your uh, phones or iPads uh, photo directory, right? And that could be linked to your iCloud. And then you can access it from there to other computers, or you can also do like an Apple share and send it uh, to, a, to a device as well. Okay, so that's, that's the whole iPad, iPhone um, concept, which is really, really fun. Uh, and exciting to to work with. So using existing technology, um, you know, all of these can do HD and maybe 4K, right? So, and different frame rates are sometimes an option as well. Okay, so let's look at the next thing. So now video with um, photography cameras, right? So video with photography cameras is great because you can use what you already have um, if you have a DSLR or uh, uh, any kind of a photo camera and they usually have a video mode, right? So um, let me just go to this top angle here. So you'll see right here, there's a, a bit of a video icon, right? So this is a, a Canon uh, Rebel that I have. And usually that's all it is, is just finding like the mode where there's like a video camera, right? So if I turn this on, you hear it go on, right? And the way I know it's in a video mode is because all of a sudden I can see the image there, right? So if it's not in video mode, it's going to go back to like a camera mode, right? So there you can see a little video camera. I'll go right there, right? And what's great about this is now we have the manual technology, right? So I can, I can zoom in, right? And I can focus with this DSLR, right? And I can zoom out on the keyboard and zoom in. Right? So it's a really great piece of uh, technology to use um, the video mode on what I already have, uh, a still camera, right? And then the, uh, the icon here, there's usually just a little button that is like a record button. So I'll hit record and you can see the red light is on 
and it's recording as well, right? And then you can basically go again back to your menu settings and uh, you know figure out different ways. You can put a grid on as well, go through formats, right? And, and it's particular to each camera, so I'm not gonna demo necessarily what's in this menu, but you go to the video settings. Again, remember frame rates, formats, do we want a grid to help us with our uh, composition? Okay, so that's the, the DSLR. And then the last thing here we wanna look at is, then we have video with video cameras, which is a really great thing. So, and it leads us to digital cinema cameras, right? So video cameras and digital cinema cameras really are fantastic because they're designed to just capture video and they're more specialized in that. Um, so you can do more frame rates, formats, different lens options and, and uh, things like that. So the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, it appeared in 2013. And since then it's uh, evolved into a 4K version. And with that model, you can do up to 120 frames per second in HD, which is uh, really fun because you can do uh, like slow motion. So if you have high frame rates and you play them back at normal, so 120 frames per second, playing back at let's say 24 frames per second, you have like a 10 times uh, you know, slow motion kind of effect where things, if someone's walking, they look like they're going really slow, right? So slow motion effects. Um, and then you can also do 60 frame HD and, and 4K and so on. So this, this camera is a, you know, a fun camera. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna introduce it over here. And so the camera here, um, this is the, the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema camera. And what's, uh, what's cool about this, is, I'm just gonna spin it around here. So it looks kind of like a, a photo camera as well, right? So you have, it looks kind of like a, a Canon 5D. Um, and then what you can do is you can, you can attach different lenses to it. And I'm just gonna go on the side here. And then, then these are, we just have like a manual lens on this one. So I can adjust the focus. I can adjust the aperture, right? And I'm gonna try and get the right angle here. But um, if I take one of these lenses off, so here I have another lens. So I'm just gonna try and get right in here. So you can see if I open all the way and then it, it goes all the way down, you can see that aperture opening and closing. There's a bit of a reflection here, but you can see how it, it gets smaller and larger. Right, so it opens and closes. And that's really great. So that's the manual exposure that we can do. So let's, let's uh, flip this camera around right over this way. Okay, so you can see here's a 16 millimeter. So it's really wide, right? And you can see it's really dark. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the aperture right, to get it nice and bright, right? So you can see here it's a little bit too bright. Here's pretty decent exposure, I can see the goat, right? And then we just wanna look at, you know, what's, is it in focus, right? So I'm just gonna focus and there we go. So you can see the 16 millimeter is a fairly wide lens, right? So that um, lets, uh, you know, us see more, right? So it's really, you know, you can see me, you can see the, my, uh, uh, face capture camera and you know you're getting kind of the whole room in here with that 16 millimeter right so it's you know that's that and it's a wide establishing shot so now I have an 85 millimeter so I just want to show what that uh, what that looks like right so I'm going to take the lens I'm going to take this lens off okay and I'm going to swap it over and put the 85 millimeter and what this is gonna do is, again, it's, think of it, again, it's like a telescope, right? So we saw 16 millimeter, and now we wanna see what 85 millimeter looks like. So see how much closer we are now? So got really close. Now again, we're overexposing here, so I'm just gonna underexpose, or sorry, reduce the aperture, close it down a little bit, right? And then we just wanna look at our focus. So see how that's the background, the backdrops in focus? And now our goat is in focus, right? So we can change that kind of focus area. So our background's a bit out of focus now 
and our goats in focus, right? So that's the 85 millimeter. So what a big difference that is, right? Going from the 60 millimeter to the 85 millimeter and uh, what we can do with that, right? So um, in terms of the whole camera, we will have an upcoming webinar on the whole camera and, and how that works um, in terms of different uh, lenses and getting into digital um, cinematography with that and the, and the different functions and features. But um, yeah, so that's pretty much, I just wanna give a, let's give a quick overview of what we're looking at. So, right, so we had the camera and so, you know, really the idea here of video production is just start exploring and learning with the equipment that you have. And like I said, we all are generally walking around with this little amazing production camera, HD camera in our pocket called a smartphone or our iPhone, right? So use it, capture things, experiment with it. Then look at framing and shot sizes and think about capturing different shot sizes. So like I demonstrated with an iPad, you can zoom in, right? Same with your phone, with your fingers or using that plus minus, a little, you can zoom in with the lens. And with that experimentation, you'll start to look at how you can use those images and framing for storytelling and to enhance your, your video capture. If you have different frame rates available on your existing technology, then experiment with those. See what faster frame rates do, slow motion and regular, you know, 30 frames. If you have 24 frames, try the different frame rates out and see what works. And it could be a lot of fun to use for different storytelling um, concepts of frame rates as, a, as an artistic choice. Then you can also explore the underexposing and overexposing, right? So think about if it's a dark, foggy day, underexpose the video and you can get a really moody, like horror film look. Or you can overexpose a bit and you can feel like you're, you know, on, a, on the uh, International Space Station and it was like, you know, white overexposed kind of idea, right? So think about that. Um, then we can experiment with different focus points, right? So we could see with, um, even right now, when I go to something like the, you know, the, the 85 millimeter, you know, like having, you know, what's in focus, right? So playing with, you know, is it the background? Is it, you know, what's in focus, out of focus, right? I can have everything out of focus, right? You can really play with what's in focus. So you can lock your focus points with your camera, like I said, if you hold on to the, the square. And then, uh, you know, finally, it can always happen, right? So, you know, if you're having a phone, a photo camera or a video camera, just start shooting explore some of these techniques and, and see where it can take you. And definitely check us out for some more webinars on the specifics of the digital cinema cameras and digital cinematography. So at this point, that pretty much wraps up the talk and the webinar. So I can take any, uh, uh, do, do a short Q&A. Uh, if anyone has some questions, you can feel free to type some in. Um, we're also going to be starting something exciting, which will be uh, some individual uh, appointments. So you can actually book appointments with, with uh, myself or some of the other uh, artist instructors. And then we can do some one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion. So if you have specific technical questions or um, need a little bit of uh, more information or some guidance, you're looking to get something, um, that will be available too. So we'll be doing like 15 minute individual sessions too. So keep your eye out for that. Those will be starting in August. Um, and like I said, go to the events.tbmcs.ca and you can sign up for more webinars. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to, to, to type them in. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll wait around for a little bit and to see if there, anyone has any questions. But um, again, just keep exploring and see what, um, what your technology can do. And it's pretty amazing uh, what is just available, uh, you know, on, a, on just, you know, your iPad. Uh, what you can do with that and the technology of what is just, you know, this tiny little camera um, and what it can do, right? So um, I should mention too, I know a lot of times, most of the examples I've been giving, right, we're really talking about the uh, horizontal um, image. And uh, so that whole idea is, you know, even what you're watching now, generally you're watching it in that horizontal mode, the, the 16 by nine kind of horizontal versus vertical. Right, so I say start with the horizontal imaging with video and uh, you know, understand that and that's great. You can always experiment with some vertical imaging. Uh, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, 
you know, if you go to see a, a video or a movie in the theater, we're watching it in that horizontal format. And I always say, you know, if you, how many people have their TV sets um, up vertically, right? So it's great to shoot horizontally. You can always uh, crop out the, the vertical there too. But things are changing. And again, it's experiment with uh, vertical as well. And it can, same things can be applied. So, you know, the um, rule of thirds can be applied with the vertical, right? And, and doing that kind of framing too. Okay, so here's here's a question. So uh, Drew's asking, so uh, rhythm, rhythm of shot sizes, uh, you know, what, how to use what and when, right? So, um, and yeah, there's definitely, uh, the idea too is uh, oftentimes in shooting video, um, I will personally like to get a whole wide shot if there's a narrative like with a dialogue scene, right? So uh, a drama, or, let's say. Um, do the whole wide shot, then there would be the medium shot and then the close-ups. So you basically shoot all of it. And then in the editing, you can decide how long to hold on the wide shot. You might choose that you love the wide shot and everything works really well in that and you don't even use the other shots. So I always say shoot, if it's a scene, a narrative scene, shoot the whole thing that way. Um, and if it's something like a documentary and you have a few shot sizes, if you have access to a couple of iPads or, you know, a, a friend or family member's phone as well, you can always set up a few shots, sizes for an interview. And that way you can actually use the different ones in the editing. So you don't even have to decide. If you have only one camera, what's fun to do in like an interview, uh, you can start wide and you can zoom in on the interview and you can always go wider if let's say the person's explaining something and go closer if there's something more intense. So that could be kind of a rhythm of shooting it, but in something that's scripted, like a, a narrative, uh, dramatic or comedy film, uh, the idea is to actually shoot the wide shot, the whole scene, then shoot the medium shot, the whole scene, and then close-ups. And then in the editing, you can decide that rhythm. So yeah, great question. Thanks again. Have a great uh, rest of the afternoon and uh, I will see you guys all soon, virtually.